Uh, hey everybody, I am Hall Fess. I am one of our Perky's um, account managers. I'm based in Chicago uh, and cover primarily the Midwest. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and healthy and doing well today. I appreciate y'all making some time to join us um, to talk about solar. We're excited about this uh, webinar. I know there's a lot of information out there around solar. Um, so we're, our goal here today is to um, really clarify things and uh, uh, break them down, discussing some key questions and some common myths around solar. Um, I apologize in advance if there is a little bit of background noise. We're working uh, from, from home as everyone else is, so trying to keep that to a minimum. Um, but uh, bear with me if that does happen just a little bit. Um, my microphone was a little glitchy earlier too. So, um, all right. So the scope for today, first we're gonna kind of, we're gonna cover just high level very quickly, why solar? Um, what applications primarily is it used for? Um, and what makes it a great charging uh, um, source? Then we're gonna go through some key questions. We're gonna look at some technologies out in the field that you'll see primarily, uh, different controllers, different types of panels, and then go through uh, how to calculate how much power you need and go through an example of what that would look like. And throughout all of this, we'll be addressing some myths that you see, and then we'll close out with three of the most common myths um, that we hear while out in the field or, or common uh, misconceptions that people ask us um, about solar while we're out in the field. So to start us off, um, Paul Weberson is on our service team and is going to kick things off talking about uh, why solar is a great uh, charging source. Well, oh, hey everybody. I'm just glad that you guys could be here with us today about uh, some th topics on solar. The first question is why solar? It's a simple one, but it's a legitimate one. We get this question asked to us a lot, uh, especially out in the field when I'm out there doing uh, some audits or some training. And uh, the best reason is that first statement, is that it allows batteries to charge without an alternator. So you're not using any fuel consumption either out of the reefer unit or out of the tractor to keep the batteries topped off for the lift gate systems. Uh, we have several customers out there that we've put our Perky solar system on that are very pleased with it due to, uh, especially this time, where they're having to load trailers and get them to suppliers quickly. And some of them, they have to sit for two, three weeks before their time to be delivered to wherever location they're going. And the truck driver has the confidence knowing that when he hooks it up and gets to his destination, the, battery, the lift gates are gonna work because the batteries are fully charged because the solar power has maintained them while it was sitting there waiting to be used. So that's the, one of the main reasons why solar, because it saves on fuel. Uh, it's energy efficient and it's green. It adds hours to your APU and your running time. It increases the charging opportunities for the lift gates, uh, not just from the tractor or the reefer, but also from the solar itself. And it saves fuel on the reefer batteries or the reefer when it's running, so you're not using the diesel fuel as well out of the, out of the uh, reefer unit. Key questions that we are asked also is what type of controller does the system use? What type of panel does the system use and how much power do you need? Well, I'll cover the first one, the controllers, and then I'll take it, send it back over to Hall to explain to you. But on the controllers, there is two types, the MPPT and the PWM. The PWM was the first initial controller that we still utilize that our engineers came up with. And it is cost effective but it has a less energy efficiency when it comes to the batteries, where the MPPT, you get a, up to 30% more efficiency. It's a little more costly, but the uh, benefits are essential when it comes to keeping those batteries charged at the lift gates. I've installed both of these out in the field and I have seen the PWM on a full sunny day. will put out anywhere from five to seven amps. And as you know, as the voltage of the batteries rise, the amps will lower. So it'll go below that five amp as the batteries get fully charged where the MPPT I've seen as high as 11 and a half amps. So it'll run a current quicker through the batteries and higher. So it'll allow the batteries to get charged a little bit faster than through the PWM. And those are the two types of controllers that Perky uses in their solar systems. Yeah, I'll let it back to Hall on uh, what, what kind of panels we use. Thanks, Paul. Uh, so, yeah, just like with the different types of controllers, 
Um, there are a couple different types of panels. And I also just want to throw out right now, we are keeping this pretty high level. If you have questions about um, kind of deeper questions about why things are working the, the way they are, you can either put them in a QA and a uh, widget at the bottom that, um, or you can uh, send us an email or reach out to us afterwards, and we'd be happy to kind of dive into the, the whys and hows and all of that behind these, um, but just want to kind of give a basic overview right now. So similar to the controllers, there are two primary types of panels that are on the market uh, in the trucking industry. There's monocrystalline and polycrystalline. Um, you'll also see technologies like thin film and, and um, a few others that are out there, but these are the two most efficient on the market and the two that we see most often, so wanted to focus on these. Now, the main differences here are that monocrystalline panels are used are made using a single piece of silicon, whereas polycrystalline are made using smaller pieces of silicon that are blended together to create uh, the solar cell. Now, what this means is that for the monocrystalline panels, they're more efficient, whereas the polycrystalline are less efficient, um, but they have a lower cost. So essentially what that trade-off looks like in, in real life is if you're looking at a monocrystalline panel, you can get more power from a smaller footprint. So a 100-watt mono crystalline panel will be smaller than a 100 watt polycrystalline panel. Um, in, some in some applications, like, uh, like on the top of the trailer where you've got a whole lot of real estate, that may not matter so much. Uh, on the top of the truck where you have limited real estate, that may, be, uh, that may matter more. Um, when we first started getting into solar at Perky's, we used a polycrystalline panel. We've since moved to a monocrystalline panel just because of that. Uh, it has some more versatility. Um, it has a higher efficiency. Um, both are good panel options. Uh, just depends kind of what you're looking for uh, at that time. So the third big question that we get is, okay, I've chosen my, I get the controller, I get the panel, but how do I know how much power that I need uh, for my application? So the difficult part on this is that depending on your application, whether it's a lift gate application, an APU application, reefer, whatever it might be, um, the amount of power that you need is gonna change, but the general idea of how to calculate that is gonna stay constant. Um, so the way you calculate that is first, you wanna look at the average amps that are being drawn from that load. So if it's a lift gate, um, as we'll see in an example we're gonna show next, you can kind of get an average idea of how much power it takes to run a lift gate um, and how long that takes. If you're in a truck, it's a little more difficult because uh, drivers will plug in all kinds of things. So it's hard to get an exact amount of power that's being drawn. Um, however, you can go in sort of a fleet by fleet basis. Uh, you know, each fleet is different, what they allow drivers to do and what drivers tend to do, uh, how long they're on the road, all that. So that's more of going to your drivers or going to um, one of your trucks, seeing what that power draw is and, uh, and getting a good idea of what that average. And um, Obviously, we would love to help with that if there are any further questions or you know, whatever uh, we can do with that. Um, a rule of thumb here, though, is so you take that amps, and then we generally use 12 volts as the voltage because it's a DC system. So you multiply those together, and that'll give you your watts. Um, we typically recommend adding about 10% to account for some efficiency losses that we mentioned before through the solar panels or through um, through the uh, controller, as well as some variations in weather and different things. Um, and just to kind of account for the higher end on that average scale, I'll just give you some room to play with. Um, a common myth though, or misconception that we see around solar panels is that people buy a 100 watt solar panel and think that they're gonna get 100 watts out of it. Um, unfortunately, right now, that is not the case with the current efficiencies and everything. The general rule of thumb is that you're gonna get about 75% output from that panel. So that being said, if you need 100 watts, it's probably the best to buy 150 watts or possibly 200 watts to make sure that you have enough power to actually uh, sustain the systems that you're running. So as I mentioned, we wanna go through a quick example of what that calculation looks like when you're actually calculating a load and figuring out how much power you need. So caveat to all this before we dive into it, We've made some assumptions on this. This is kind of uh, what we use at Perky's to, when we talk to customers, to understand their operations and what that looks like regarding uh, how many panels they need. So 
a few assumptions that we make are um, assuming that the weather, we kind of try to take in uh, average out sunny and cloudy days so we don't put out or we don't account for full output on the panels. Um, this also accounts for that 75% output on the, the 100 watts. So we wouldn't quite, we wouldn't count for the full 110 watts being put out here. Um, and there's a few other things that are kind of built in that we can um, get into offline if you're, if you're curious or have any questions. Um, but essentially what the formula is, is that for a rail lift, we calculate that on average, it takes 250 amps to run the lift one time. It takes about 18 seconds to run that lift one time. So we divide that by the 3,600 seconds that are in an hour and multiply it by our amps to get 1.25 amp hours per hour. So that just tells you every time you run a lift, it runs 1.25 amp hours of energy. So in order to calculate that, we can then take the voltage from um, the batteries and we can, um, or excuse me, we can take the wattage from, from that panel. Uh, we can look at if it's 110 watts, you know, if it's 75% output, uh, that's going to bring that down a little bit. If it's a cloudy day, it's going to bring down a little more. And we can actually run that basic calculation saying, if this is the amount of energy I'm pulling, this is the basic voltage that, um, that the batteries are going to be at when they're charging. We use 12 to 13 volts usually. Um, we can get, we can figure out how many lifts we expect to get out of a single panel, two panels, or three panels. Um, and again, there's a lot of variation in here. There are some assumptions being made. Uh, we do have a tool on our website that um, is linked at the end of this webinar that allows you to input the state that you're operating in primarily. And this takes some of the variation out because we can account for weather patterns and things within those states. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in getting a, a high level view of what that would look like on the liftgate side, we have that available. But this is kind of the, an overview of what that calculation looks like. Find your amps. Look at your voltage, and that'll count or uh, be able to calculate your wattage um, through that system or through that uh, equation. Some of the biggest things that we hear um, questions about, and and kind of all the variation that I was that we were talking about in that last example, comes through environmental factors. So, a lot of people ask, you know, if I'm down in Arizona or if I'm down up in Minnesota how is that gonna affect my solar output? And the thing is, and what I thought originally is that if you're down in Florida, or you're down somewhere where it's really hot all the time and you've got really good sun, that means your solar is gonna work, you know, as optimally as it can. Uh, I was surprised to learn that uh, once the temperature gets above like 75 to 78 degrees, that uh, efficiency actually starts diminishing some. So, it is actually ideal if it's on a sunny but sort of cold day. So if it's anywhere you know below 75 degrees, down 50, 40, 30, but it's sunny, it's gonna work really well. Um, so just something to keep in mind. We also have a lot of people that ask about uh, cloud cover, snow cover, dirt, length of daytime, all of that kind of thing. And those do come into effect in, many, in different ways. So uh, as you can see on this graph, depending on the time of year, January to December, that red dotted line, depending on the time of year, your um, days are gonna be longer or shorter. Um, you're gonna get more or less sunlight and it's going to affect the output of your panels. It also depends on where you are. So in Canada, you have longer days of longer sunlight in certain parts of the year. And in certain parts of the year, we have very little sunlight. Whereas in the US, it's a little bit more constant, but it's, it's uh, varies wide, more widely throughout the day. Um, so there, there are some different things um, that come into play based on your geography. And again, just bring it back to um, you know, our, our tool we've got, if you plug in your state, it'll kind of take some of that variability out and, and should help with, with that. <clears throat> Before we get on to our myths, I wanna talk through just a few of these um, key weather uh, environmental factors. Um, so cloudy days, for example, we're going to dive into a little more uh, in, a, in a later slide. But um, a lot of people ask if, uh, if cloudy days will affect your solar, and the answer is yes. Um, generally, it will diminish uh, the power coming in. Uh, a lot of people ask if snow will affect your solar, and the answer again is yes. If the snow, particularly if it's uh, any kind of thick snow, um, you will not be able to get to get power out of your um, solar panels. So 
That's not to say that solar is not a good option. Again, it works really well in the cold as long as it's sunny. Um, but just to make sure that if you have solar up, up north or somewhere where it's uh, where it's snowy, that you are cleaning those panels, you're cleaning your roofs, you're making sure that uh, that those aren't covered in inches of snow when you're driving. Um, and it's similar with with dirt and with debris. Um, and real quick, there were a couple questions that came up that we want to talk to real quick. So one is asking about, jumping back, asking about the 75% output uh, and average across the day or at solar noon. So the 75% output is generally saying that uh, whatever, so the panels are tested whenever that 100, so for a 100 watt panel, that is tested in, in a lab under perfect conditions with perfect sunlight at high noon. Um, and so we're, the general rule of thumb is that that 100, 100, um, 100 watt output is under optimal conditions. With different environmental factors out there, the number that um, you'll see most likely is 70 to 75% output is what is expected in real world experiences, particularly in the, in the trucking industry um, or RV industry where you get a lot of these different factors coming into play. Um, so that is saying that at high noon on a nice day, you should expect 75% output on average from your panel. And then that will also um, just vary and it will be 75% of expected output at any time during that day. <clears throat> There's another question asking which lasts longer, the mono panel or the poly panel? So that's a good question. Um, Within both of these panel types, it's similar to kind of any, any other um, technology that you have. Within a mono panel category, there can still be different levels of quality within that category. Um, within the poly category, there can be different levels of quality. And there are actually, um, within both those categories, different subtypes of technology within those. So. Um, it makes it hard to give a general rule of thumb of which lasts longer. <sighs> Typically, it kind of just depends on the manufacturer. Um, I've seen different uh, manufacturers warranty warranties for um, for different types of panels, and um, it, it's really hard to to kind of nail down which one of those is going to last longer. It's just knowing that whichever one um, you have, your monos are going to get a higher efficiency level than your than your polys. Okay, man, we're getting uh, we're getting a lot of questions coming in. I may uh, I may hold off. There's a Q and A session at the end, so I may hold off and go through the rest of these myths, and then Paul can be looking at some of those too, and we'll uh, make sure we get to all those questions at the end. I just want to kind of keep this thing flowing right now. Um, so as I mentioned, environmental factors are a huge issue when it comes to calculating how much power you need because there's so much variance within that and so many things that can affect it. But three of kind of the main things that we hear people talk about when we discuss solar um, and kind of the misconceptions that come up, um, we're going to go through those real quick. So the first one is we have a lot of people asking, you know, saying, I may not be on the road as much, but when I'm parked, I'm parked under um, under some lights, or when I load and unload, I'm under some lights, and um, these lights can turn on the panels and can actually charge my batteries for me. Um, so unfortunately, at the moment, that's not the case. While technically the panels do can turn on from the, from the lights, studies have shown that they only produce six watts per meter squared, and that's compared to a standard panel, so the 110-watt panel we have will uh, put out about 165 watts per meter squared uh, on a good sunny day. So the six watts per meter squared is such a small number that it doesn't actually even turn on the controller. Um, it doesn't charge your battery. So while technically uh, the lights do turn on the panel, um, they don't do it in a way that is actually going to benefit the batteries. Uh, and the main difference between that, is, or the reason behind that, is that the light emitted from the sun and the light emitted from the bulbs is such a different um, level of brightness and it covers such, so if you look at um, the light spectrum, the light from the sun covers the whole spectrum, whereas the light from the bulbs only couples, covers a partial spectrum. So the blend of the lower power level um, 
and the, the lower spectrum coverage on that um, means you're not going to get uh, the enough power from the bulbs to actually be, uh, be turning your panels on. Um, a second question that we hear a lot is about solar working at night. Um, so theoretically, people are, you know, the, the question is, the sun reflects off the moon. So could that power then turn on the solar panel because it, it is in a way sunlight? Um, and unfortunately, right now, again, that's not the case. The ratio of, um, so while the moonlight can turn on the panel, the ratio of power is 345 to 1. So what that means is that 110 watt panel would put out, excuse me, about 0.32 watts at night which again is just too low of a power level to uh, turn on the controller. Um, what is kind of cool, in case you're interested, is they are developing um, night panels. It would be a different thing than solar panels. Unfortunately, they wouldn't work together, but they are working on a technology that would be able to um, use the moonlight to, uh, to create power. So that would uh, be a pretty cool development down the road whenever it happens. Can, can I add something to that? And, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, um, the nighttime it doesn't happen because the way the silicone cells are inside these panels is there's a, uh, they got to have sunlight to allow the photons and the molecular structure of that silicone to move. And once it starts moving, that's when it creates the DC electricity, which allows it to go through the wires. So that's why it's very difficult for it to work at night because it needs that sunlight to create the molecular movement in the panel itself. Yep, exactly, thank you, Paul. Um, and then the third panel that we wanna to touch on before we get to, to these questions that are rolling in, uh, a lot of people ask, we kind of talked about earlier, whether solar works on cloudy days. Now I've heard some people say solar doesn't work at all on cloudy days. I've heard other people say that solar works even better on cloudy days because it somehow holds in the, the radiance or the radiation of the sun and can um, continue working on the solar panel. Uh, for better or worse, depending on which side of this you're on, either of those is the case. So typically whenever uh, people are doing testing, the rule of thumb is that on a cloudy day, your output for a panel is gonna be about 50%. Um, sometimes I see numbers raised as high as 75%. Um, but it's going to be a reduced output. It sort of depends on the level of cloud cover, how dense those clouds are, all of that. Um, but that to say, solar will work on a cloudy day. It just will be diminished output, um, won't get the full output you're working on. So uh, again, going back to our lift gate example, that is one thing that makes it difficult is where we have to account for the efficiency of the panel, the efficiency of the controller, kind of take a range of cloudy days versus sunny days, depending on the geography, and you can figure out um, kind of how much you need. Um, so it's just based on some assumptions, which uh, are always difficult to work with, but um, it's, it's not uh, undoable, just makes it something to think through um, as you're making these calculations. So real quick before we get to the Q&A, just something to keep in mind, these are all on your resource panel at the bottom. So if we've talked about something that uh, you would like to dig in more to. Our sister company, Xantrex, has made two videos, one about how much solar you need, so it kind of goes deeper into how to make that calculation, um, and one on the MPPT versus PWM. So if you want to learn a little more about those two technologies, uh, there's a really great video on those as well. We also have our solar bolt data sheet, so you can look at our panel and kind of get an idea of what it looks like to look at a, at a panel spec sheet. Um, and, uh, and ask us any questions if you've got any about what does these numbers mean, how does this affect the charging, that sort of thing. And then we also have uh, our solar calculator. So if you'd like to get an idea um, of what kind of power you need, that's also linked in the resources page. Um, so we're gonna go into the Q&A session right now and try to answer some of these questions that have come through. Really appreciate all the, everyone who's been asking questions. Um, and also, I've just been reminded for any of you, uh, uh, if everyone can stick around right after this presentation, there is going to be a, uh, a little survey just to see if there are any other questions or anything else we should cover. Okay, so I answered that one, sorry. Uh, 
Um, sorry, it's taking a second. Okay, here we go. So the question is, um, what is the definition of working? We've we've talked about that word kind of come up. Um, so again, just going back to some of these uh, slides that we mentioned before, a panel could be turned on technically um, if it's moonlight or if it's under fluorescent bulbs, um, but it's not actually going to be charging anything. If it's really dense cloud cover, the panel will be working, but it's just going to be working at a diminished capacity. If it's really snowy um, on top of your panel, it's probably not going to be working at all. Um, so just something that uh, that we want to keep in mind whenever you're talking about a panel working, what does that really mean um, and under what conditions are, are we talking about? Um, there, everything is tested and that rated output is tested on imperfect lab conditions with perfect sunlight. Um, so anything that's going to be below that uh, is going to diminish them, that output. So we're getting a lot of questions or a couple of questions about um, why warmer temperatures affect performance. And I'm sorry, I think we're lagging again. Um, okay. Warmer temperatures affect performance. And the reason is that um, essentially just like with kind of any technology, as things get really hot, they just, it doesn't work as well. So you see the same thing if you go into like a server room for computers, you want to keep it cold if your computer starts overheating or your phone starts overheating. Um, just as everything gets very hot, um, things start, uh, any kind of technology is just going to work less, efficient, less efficiently. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not an engineer, so I'm, I'm still learning on the exact uh, reactions that has on the electrons. Um, Paul may have a little more information on that. If not, uh, I'd be happy to follow up with our engineers and get a more precise, uh, precise answer on that um, as to why it, it, they, they start degrading at those higher temperatures. Okay, it would be that like any other electrical device or uh, load that when something starts getting really hot, um, it starts, the efficiency levels start to drop on the operation of it. So then it needs to be pulling more power to operate efficiently. And a lot of times when it's that hot, uh, it doesn't flow as quickly and as needed. Uh, so that's why the efficiency levels will drop down on that because it's trying to work harder than it's uh, designed to with that extreme heat. Perfect, thank you, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question is, is the profile of the two panels the same or are they equally durable? Um, so kind of discussed the durability a little earlier, depending on poly or mono, the durability depends a lot on the quality of the panel itself. Um, you can get, you know, just like anything, you can get something that is supposed to be very nice, but if it's not manufactured right, then it's not gonna be um, going to be very durable. If you've got a, a good quality panel, um, both technologies are equal, are, are very durable. Um, just so just making sure that the supplier is, is someone that uh, is trusted and someone that uh, that has the references and everything you need. Um, as far as the profile of the two panels, so the general charging profile is the same of the panel output, um, but the efficiency level is going to be um, is going to be different. So essentially what that means is that while the profile for the mono might be somewhere up here, the profile for the poly might just be down here. Um, it'll look the same, but it'll be less efficient. Now, the main thing to keep in mind is a panel takes in the power from the sun and puts it out at a certain voltage level, usually around 17 plus volts. Um, so the, main, uh, the big thing to look at when you're looking at charging profiles is, um, is bringing that controller into play because the controller is going to take the power from the panel and make sure that it's put uh, it's the correct level um, to go into your batteries. So making sure that your controller has the um, multi-stage charging to make sure it doesn't overcharge your batteries. Also to make sure um, that's kind of what we talked about with the MPPT versus the PWM controllers. The MPPT is more um, is more efficient. So essentially, what that means is that when you're taking the 17 volts from the panel and you're stepping that down to the 12 volts of the battery, it's also the MPPT controller can also take the amperage 
that's the that's found in that difference and increase it to put that power back in the battery. So it's essentially taking the, the diminished voltage, converting that and pushing that amperage into the batteries. Whereas the PWM takes that voltage down, but then that amperage is lost um, in loss efficiency. So the profile of the panels is the same, just the different efficiency levels. But the main thing to look at when you're looking at charging profiles is to focus on the controller because that's what's really going to matter when talking about getting the power correctly to your batteries. Great question, thank you. Um, sorry, one second. Kind of lagging over here. Okay, here we go. Um, is there a panel that fits on dash for a vehicle that sits for long periods and can keep yeah. up with the parasitic draws batteries enough to start the vehicles after, say, a month? Paul, you want to go and chime in? Sure. Yeah, Perkins has uh, for years had a system called a solar dash, which is a small 20-watt solar panel that does fit on a dash and it plugs into the cigarette lighter of the vehicle. And this will keep the battery topped off. Uh, we have never, me personally, tested for a full month, but uh, I'm sure that it would be able to keep that battery topped off until you need it to start, unless the battery itself has a bad cell or something in it, then it would be fighting back and forth with each other. But uh, on, under normal conditions, I would say, yes, it would be able to start it if it's that for a month. You can go to our website yeah, and, again, the main thing. and look at that solar dash and uh, it'll give you all the specs and uh, everything that you need to know about it uh, if you're inquiring on uh, getting one for your vehicle. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, we have another question. Will driving at reduced speed through a snowstorm keep the panels clean? Should one stop periodically to clean them? That's a great question. Um, yeah. So, the sorry, we trying to chime in? Yeah, um, I was going to say. Uh, so, if you're driving through. Go ahead. Yeah, if you're uh, driving through a snowstorm and trying to keep reduced speed to keep the panels clean, uh, it depends on what type of snow it is, for one. If you've got a uh, powdery snow, uh, it's going to slide right off the roof of the trailer. But if you've got a very wet snow and uh, then it starts getting colder temperatures wherever you're traveling, uh, that wet snow could start to freeze and then it would build up on top of the panels. And uh, I would only stop to clean it uh, when you stop for food or to free fuel up, because while the tractor is running, and you have a perky system on the trailer up front, it's going to be charging the batteries for the lift gates uh, above and beyond the, the solar. Uh, so uh, it would just depend on how, what kind of a snow it is and uh, the temperature where you're going. But I would say uh, it would just when you stop for a few or food, then I would go and check it. And uh, one of the things I found in the field uh, to a quick cleanup, if you get access to the panel or reach over the top, is a... 50-50 mixture of alcohol and water and spray on it, and it melts that snow instantly off it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, got a question, quick questions about installation and maintenance. How difficult is the install, and are they hard to maintain? Paul, you want to take those? Sure. Uh, it's very easy to install. Uh I, I've got it down to about an hour and a half, personally, when I'm out in the field installing these for some of our customers. But the first few that I did, it took me two hours. So it's it's a very easy install uh, from start to finish. The, the biggest key is the prep work, making sure the roof area or the hood area, wherever you're putting the solar panels, is clean and free of debris. Uh, and we use a uh, an MEK or an alcohol compound to spray on there and wipe it down, and I'll do that three times. Uh, before I even consider putting the panels down. Uh, and then just follow the instructions that's in our guide because it's all step by step. And uh, we've uh, we've tested it out many, many times and have not had any issues. So, and to maintain the solar, it's just a matter of uh, getting up there. And like I said, in the wintertime with the snow, a 50-50 mixture of alcohol and water in a spray bottle. Uh, other than that, uh, I have taken an actual dust mop with a clean, damp, rag on it and just wiped over the panels 
to clean them off and uh, they'll be, they're ready to go. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got a question, how do you calculate the number of batteries needed before adding solar? Um, so a lot of that goes into that overall calculation. There's not necessarily a set amount, a set number of batteries you need. It's more looking at the overall amps being drawn from your system. So um, for example, we have customers on the reefer side who um, they've just got a single battery, but they're only putting maybe a GPS or something on there that pulls a very small amount of amperage. Um, so you only need one battery. Whereas if you've got uh, a lot of parasitic load or if you've got a very high drawing um, uh, load like a lift gate, then you would want to have multiple batteries on there. So something to keep in mind with the solar is it, it will charge throughout the day. It is not necessarily, it's not like an alternator where it's going to be putting out 180 amps or something like that. It's going to be putting out, um, most systems go as high as, 30 amps or so um, in good sunlight. So it's more keeping looking at the output you're actually getting from the solar and the amount of power you're pulling from the, uh, from the load uh, from the batteries and then kind of backing into, okay, if my solar is putting in this much, my battery or my load is pulling out this much, what's kind of that difference? Uh, how much power do I need in reserve through those batteries? in order to ensure that I have enough power to run my uh, run my load for the length of time I need to run it. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Um, sorry, it takes a second to switch between uh, questions here. Um, okay, can solar charge uh, electric pallet jacks, and what will be required to do so? That's, that's a great question. We get a lot of people asking about some pallet jacks. Um, so unfortunately, solar cannot directly charge pallet jacks just because um, it is a very inconsistent power source and getting that conversion to the 24 volts needed consistently for the pallet jacks is not, it, it might be able to be done sporadically, but it's not going to be anything consistent. So generally what we recommend is to have the pallet jack, the charging system for the pallet jack. This is how our system, for example, is set up, our tap system. Um, we have the pallet jack connected to the lift gate batteries or some auxiliary battery. And then we have solar um, that's charging that battery. So it's not necessarily charging the pallet jack directly, but it's able to keep that battery charged so that the pallet jack can then have consistent power from that battery. Um, and then it's just sort of looking at how long your run times are going to be and how much power your pallet jack charger is pulling. Um, and that can kind of give you an idea of how many batteries you need and, um, and how much solar you need. A lot of times you see people pulling off of the lift gate batteries, um, which is okay in certain situations. It's just something to be careful of because you're also running the lift gate, obviously, off those batteries. So sometimes that drain can be too much. Um, so there just is that calculation to understand uh, how much power is being pulled from, again, how much power we need to put back in to make sure that you're appropriately compensating for the power draw and the, the power loss there. So I've got one on cost. What range of cost per watt are we looking at? So typically for the, the numbers I've seen just for a, a panel, a Thin panel is anywhere between a buck twenty-five and a buck fifty a watt, but that is just for the panel. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, the big piece of these systems is the controller, which uh, is what's actually taking the power from the uh, from the panel and putting it into the batteries. So, making sure that controller has all the different things you need to uh, ensure it's reading the battery correctly. Um, correctly charging the battery at the different stages is not going to boil your battery. Um, if you just took a, a solar panel up to the battery, you're going to boil it. Uh, it's inevitable that it's going to boil. Um, so the the cost per watt, you can just kind of, most of those, you can go online and get kind of a good idea of if you're just buying a panel, what that would look like. Um, but most of these systems come with some extra cabling and the, the controller and everything you need to make sure that it's, that it's working uh, accurately. So that's going to 
obviously raise that cost more than just the panel. <clears throat> Okay, um, what panels are you using and what types of inverters and brand? So um, I'm not completely sure if this is asking uh, what we're using in, in our calculations or what we actually use. Um, Perky's in our systems, we use a monocrystalline panel. Um, we have those manufactured to our spec, uh, which is the same with the controller. We do a lot of that programming in-house. Uh, we primarily use an MPPT controller with that mono crystalline panel right now. We're just trying to maximize that efficiency um, to as high a level as we can. Um, there's also uh, some other technology within the panel we use. Again, I mentioned before that there are some technologies within the mono and poly um, categories. So we have... Um, it's called five bus bar in there to really try to bring in a little more sunlight. Um, just kind of trying to do anything we can to, to get as much power out of those panels as possible. Um, inverters, if we're talking about on the APU, so Perky's personally, we still um, have modified sine wave and pure sine wave inverters at different wattages. We have 1500 watt and 2000 watt. Um, as I mentioned before, that's kind of what makes it difficult to calculate things on the APU side because there are multiple different types of inverters and there are a lot of different sizes. So um, when it comes through to calculating that load size and calculating um, how much power you need, it kind of goes to a fleet by fleet basis, what inverter you're using, what size is it, what's generally uh, the, uh, what's generally the uh, amount of power on average being pulled from through that inverter. Um, so happy to, uh, dig more into that offline if, if that didn't quite answer the question, but um, hopefully it was helpful. <laughs> this is great. We've got all kinds of questions here. Uh, um, okay. What is the life expectancy of a solar panel charging system under normal conditions? Five years, 10 years. Um, so, Normal conditions, that's a good question. <laughs> so on the liquid side, uh, normal conditions means that it's under the under the, um, the truck and the battery box. It's pretty well protected. I know our system, for example, has a three-year warranty on every on all the components of the system. That being said, we generally uh, expect this to last longer. Um, we build it with the same robustness as our liftgate charging system, which we've seen on trucks 5, 10, 15 years down the road. So, you know, five years would not, would seem be reasonable. Um, 10 years does not seem like a stretch. The main thing is just to, like Paul mentioned, make sure you're cleaning your panels, um, checking them, because they, they are durable, um, very durable, but like anything, they can be damaged. So just making sure when you're doing PMs, whenever you're looking things over, that you're getting up and just doing a visual check, making sure that uh, that they're, not uh, that they haven't been damaged in some way um, by debris or by tree limbs or anything like that. Um, unfortunately, that, that can happen. So, um, yeah, I hope, I hope that was helpful. What is the efficiency of these panels? Um, so the, it's a good question and also a difficult question. I'm uh, trying to answer these as, as well as I can. So. Typically, the highest efficiency panel really that you see on the market is about 22-ish percent efficient. Um, but again, that is efficiency of just the panel, not counting the uh, kind of efficiency drop of the controller. And it's also efficiency in a lab setting. So those panels, like the, the efficiency numbers that you'll see online or, or on spec sheets, um, those are, you know, as good as efficiency numbers as we can get, but they are in a lab setting. So typically, um, poly panels, the range is about 13 to 16% and mono panels range is about 15 to 20%. And that feels like a better, uh, real world range than some of the ranges on the spec sheets, which are more of the 22, um, 23%. 
range. Um, again, a lot of those are just in the in the lab settings and, and don't necessarily hold under real world conditions. Um, I'm seeing a couple questions we'll reach out to on offline. Um, they're just a little more specific. So we have one question um, saying they tried panel. Um, that uh, sounds like that size we've been talking about, the 110 watt, and the amps are not enough to keep up. Um, so yes, that can definitely happen. Uh, we'll, I'll, I'll send an email offline to see if we can kind of talk through your system and what you're looking at. But um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of different things that come into play here. So a lot of times you, you do need to over compensate. So if you think you need 100 watts, it's probably better to get 150. If you think you need um, you know, 200, you get a little bit more to, to account for some of that variability and some of that loss of, of efficiency. That's just unfortunately um, going to happen. Uh, a question here about height. Yes, so unfortunately, we don't do residential or commercial. We just do vehicle. Um, but uh, be happy to help with anyone's uh, vehicle needs. So it says, can a roof setup be used to run AGM tractor batteries for an APU? Um, so the question asked specifically on trailer, we don't necessarily really recommend putting the, the panels on a trailer and then running them to a tractor, especially if those are in a disconnected scenario because there are those cables running through. Um, we would recommend if you've got, if you're looking for extra power on APU to put those panels on top of the truck. And we have, uh, we have multiple customers testing that now and it's really great for them. Again, just something to keep in mind on the truck side, it takes a little bit more to calculate what that, uh, what that power output is going to be. We have some different tools that we partic that we at Perky's use to um, discover what that output is and kind of find come to that average. And uh, would be happy to to talk with anyone about those and and help understand what that power output is going to going to be on the truck. Um, but yeah, generally we recommend if you're going to be be powering a truck, put the panels on the truck. Powering a trailer, put the panel on a trailer, just to make sure that the power source is staying with the vehicle. Um, and they don't get disconnected or something like that just a uh, level of variability into things. Um, and also have a panel, a question about mounting the panel on a truck. Um, that's a great question. We didn't, didn't talk about too much before Paul mentioned it. So most of these panels, um, are, have an adhesive on the back. Um, so they can just adhere to whatever surface, as Paul mentioned, we want to make sure we clean that surface very well. And also, if you're installing panels, it's important to note that it, it needs to be above a certain temperature level typically to install them. Um, so if it is really cold outdoors where you are, you'll either want to wait or get into a warmer environment before you install those panels in order to let them properly adhere to the surface. Um, but yeah, they, they, the adhesive works great in all conditions. We also do have grommets on our panel as an option if you feel more comfortable having them bolted down in whatever situation that is. Uh, but we've, we've seen that the adhesive work great. Thank you for that question. Let's see. So we have a question here. Should you put the panels at the front or the back of the trailer? Paul, uh, maybe you can jump in on that. You've got some experience, in the, more experience in the field installing these. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, basically, uh, it basically depends it on the customer's needs and how they want to the trailer it is. is. I'd say probably 80% of the ones I have installed out in the field for the customers that we have put on the back of the trailer. And the reason being is uh, there's a lot of it is North Country, so you get the snow brushes that they go through. Uh, which takes it off the back and the way the wiring is, it's going backwards. So as the truck is running down the interstate, whether it's in dry weather or wet weather, the cables are in flow with the motion of airflow going across the top of that trailer instead of against it. 
and uh, it just makes everything even neater, smoother, and more efficient because you're not rattling the wires or the cables um, and the controller itself to where it's getting any type of vibration damage that could possibly happen in the future. So that's the best place uh, that I've seen is in the back, but some prefer it in the front, some prefer it on the side. It depends on the application they're wanting and uh, what the customer trailer is actually utilized for. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, next question, would a solar panel help a straight truck application with a lift gate? Um, yes, so this, this is actually a great application for solar. A lot of those straight trucks do not have auxiliary batteries. Um, so they don't have that extra reserve and they're just working off the truck batteries like everything else. In this solution, a solar panel is a great way to make sure that you're getting extra power to those truck batteries um, and getting that uh, added charging while you're going down the road. Um, one thing to keep in mind as you look at different uh, solar controllers, there are some, um, so ours in particular has been programmed um, with uh, patented technology to make sure that our system is still running alongside the alternator and is going in first to, to get that extra power to the batteries. Um, there are some controllers that if the alternator is on, it will put the char the solar charger on standby um, and won't actually be engaged. So that is just something to, to keep in mind when you're looking at different controller options um, to make sure if you're counting on this, charging your truck, uh, your batteries while you're driving to make sure that it's actually going to do that. Um, while you're going, but yeah, so thanks for that question. Straight truck application, um, great opportunity for solar. Um, even like we mentioned before, putting something in the dash to make sure what's in there or, or, or whatnot that, that you have extra power. Just got a few more questions here. Um, can you connect the controller to a single battery or does it need to go across the bank of batteries? Uh, so good question. So if it is connected to a bank of batteries, then it does need to be installed across the bank of batteries. So just like really any battery charger, if you're charging all the batteries, um, you want to have that charging going across the multiple batteries. If you are, um, if you are, um, just doing one battery, that's fine too. Um, and you can just put it on that, on that one battery. Okay, and I am getting a, a note to wrap up. So any questions that we haven't, um, haven't answered yet, we will go ahead and, and do that offline. I'll send an email out uh, separately and we will make sure your questions get answered. Um, thank you all so much for being here. As mentioned before, there is a quick survey after this is wrapped up. Um, so if you could please stay on for two minutes, give us a little bit of feedback. Um, that would be really helpful for this and just to make sure we have the, the right information um, for the industry and that will be most helpful to you going forward. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you.